Okay. <laughs> For this Zoom session. Um, all right, let's talk about, I have my volume turned up. Let's talk about the blue eyed brown eyed study. All right, I put a couple of videos up there. I put one where she was lecturing. It, it does turn out on Santa, absolutely. And this little here, this little indicator here, that's a giveaway. Right now I've got a little giveaway. Um, but uh, so yeah, let's, let's talk about uh, blue eyed brown eyed study. Jane Elliott, amazing individual. So she does the piece with the kids, right? She does it over two days and boom, gets results. She also goes into a Department of Corrections meeting on Saturday where you don't get paid if you don't do this training. That was also very interesting. And then there's another lecture that I showed you. So believe me, I have seen this, I don't even know, I've seen this 30 times. I've seen it as much as I've probably seen Star Wars. No, no, I won't blaspheme, I won't go there. I have not seen it as much as Star Wars, but almost. So I'm pretty well versed in this piece. Let's pick out the pieces in the blue eyed brown eyed study, kids or adults or the other lecture that stand out to you. Jane Elliott's doing some really, really important work and there's a lot going on and she's not explaining everything. That's not her job. Like once you've seen these videos, you know her job is not, not to hold you and cuddle you and hug you and it's, it's, it's on. So what stood out to you about uh, the blue eyed brown eyed study or, or the videos that we watched for this piece? Again. If I'm telling you, I'm trying to present cool stuff to you about sociology, and this is the one thing I would show you if I had all semester long, then, then this is, I mean, I think, I think this could be one of the most important social pieces or, or pieces that anybody ever watches. Uh, it, it might not have struck you that way or it might have struck you that way. Um, I'm moved to tears actually by it often. Uh, and that's because this is important stuff to me. So I'll stop talking now. What do you think? What stands out to you, either with the kids, the adults, or her lecture? And, and then we'll, we'll, and then of course, through that, we'll, we'll incorporate this sort of social discussion. Um, I thought what was really interesting to me was like, so I'm, I'm a psych major, so I like stuff about psychology. So one of the things I really like is if you've ever heard of Carl Jung, like his, the shadow, or the Jungian shadow, it's basically the idea that like in every human being, there exists like a darker part of your mind that where evil resides. So I thought it was interesting just to see in those kids, like just to see the experiment unfold, like how she, when she put in their heads, the idea that, you know, brown eyed people were superior, how like those kids who had like one day been friends and like all chill with each other and had played with each other on the playground, like completely switched just because of feeding that, you know, evil part in their brain or just how that even in kids who, you know, we like to think of kids as innocent a lot of the times, like that part, still, like the Jungian shadow still exists in the ki in kids. So of course it exists in adults. So it's kind of, it was kind of interesting to see uh, how it works in kids. Yeah. Um, and they went there, right? They, they went there. What are some of the things that they did? uh to either show their dominance or or sort of whatever lila well i noticed the kids uh like there was that one boy who got into the fight and said that the other kid was taunting him like brown eyes brown eyes and then he hit him and then i thought that was really interesting because it was something like i have brown eyes it was something that wouldn't have bothered this child days before but right. just kind of that insinuation and then all of a sudden somebody's using that to taunt somebody and then you kind of get physical you get into like an actual fight with somebody yeah um so he's the one that's like uh, they were teasing me and i hit him i hit him in the gut right and she asks some very important follow-up questions did it make things better no did it make you feel better no right like was anything solved by violence and and he was pretty clear about it. No. And then somebody's like, yeah, what made you feel better, right? <laughs> like like there's somebody joins in there and says something like, yeah, but you feel better or something felt better for a second. But yeah, so using, uh, using that instantly against somebody and then having a fight break out already. Uh, okay, go ahead. What else? Because there's a lot. There's a lot in this piece. 
what other ways did they oppress them or what things did they say that they could do to those kids? Did you catch who caught more of that? How did the teacher tell them that brown eyed kids were inferior? She couldn't just tell them you're better. She had a set of rules. What were her set of rules? Um, I know she did use like she placed the collars on them for like the brown eyed or the blue eyed though, whatever the ones are superior. And she did place like um, you don't have extra recess time. You can't use a water fountain. Um, what else? No going back for seconds. Yeah, no seconds. It's just like small things like that, that the kids would just like, what, that's not fair just because of my eye color and stuff like that. But she, they felt like more superior because of the collars that they were wearing. Yeah, and, and Jane started this piece, right? She talked about it when she had read the book, The Nazi Doctors. And it was right after, you know, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And instantly she was like, I'm watching the TV coverage of this and, and it's awful. Like it's, it's awful. So yeah, the collars, of course, we understand that, you know, same thing in Nazi Germany where you have to wear, right, the band, the armband that identifies you so you can tell from a distance. Um, good. Uh, she was saying, and she wasn't just saying, right, you, what, you can't have any seconds. And kids were like, why? What'd she say? Anybody? So blue-eyed kids are wasteful. Our brown eyed kids are wasteful, right? They're, they'll waste it. So she was kind of like coming up with those. When a kid would answer a question slowly, she'd be like, well, that's a brown eyed, right? Like, or one of the kids in the class said that, that's a brown eyed. So she's really taking every little moment to reinforce that dominance. What else, uh, what else stands out to you about this? I think it was interesting how she, like where that guy was writing on the board and she was like oh you did such a good job like that's such good work even though it was just like basic handwriting but it was like she made it seem like oh you did such a good job because you have brown blue eyes and i think that like little things like that are why it was so important that she did the study with children that were so young because they're so easily influenced and like having somebody superior tell them that kind of stuff is really yeah yeah and i heard somebody say kids are innocent i've got a comment here that said kids are ruthless uh and of course she said you know, there's, this isn't a perfect thing. It could damage somebody in reality. But what do you think about kids doing this or not? Damaged easily? Kids are ruthless? Think back, think back to your own times, you know, in first, second, third, fourth grade. Anybody got a comment on that? I have an opinion, but I'd rather hear yours. I think that it really did like um, influence the kids because like she said that their test scores went down when they were in like the oppressed group and they went up when they weren't. Um, so like it definitely had an influence, but then their test scores did got, kind of go back to normal afterwards. So I feel like the way that she kind of concluded it and like brought it in to show that she was teaching them a lesson, not just like treating them like that for no reason. Yeah, I think that was a big part. You can't do the blue eyed brown eyed thing and then just be like, see you later, <laughs> right? But. Yeah, let's talk about that. She sent those results to Stanford. And Stanford said, this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense that if you tell somebody they're not as good, that they actually perform worse instantly. This, I have goosebumps, and for all the wrong reasons, right? This is so substantive because it proves that if you are told that you are good and capable and smart, and you, you got it going on, you will more likely be those things, right? To the point where you will actually perform higher in school. I mean, I drop off each one of my kids every single day and I'm like, you're the best thing that's ever been around. I love you, crush it, have a great day. You're the most creative person in the world. You're handsome as well, see you later. Like, and, and this is, what we have to understand is that whether parents say those things overtly or not, people are internalizing those messages. People are internalizing the messages by looking around them in society of who is more valued. And we know that by looking and talking to kids that are people of color, that they internalize messages that they are inferior and not as good as. And that plays a dramatic and real role in somebody's life chances just by telling them that. And it was a considerable amount of difference. Now, I don't know if you caught it or not, but one of the kids when they do the card packs, 
says one of the groups is talking or they might, what did he say? He, one of the kids goes so far as to suggest corporate punishment. Does anybody, did anybody catch that? You'd really have to be watching it closely to catch it. I did. He said something about like getting the ruler out or like something. Yeah, the yardstick. Yeah, the yardstick. And, and every, like, every teacher crazy. in their classroom used to have a yardstick, right? And it wasn't to beat kids. That's in the Catholic church. My dad went to Catholic church school. And here's how they would punish you. Go outside to a tree and cut a switch for me to beat you with. And if you cut a switch off that tree that is too thin, I will cut one that's not. That's what my dad said. I mean, you want to talk about brutal. You got to go cut your own instrument that you will be beat with. That's, you think you got it tough. <laughs> I, did, I, did, I thought I had it tough. It wasn't that tough, right? So he says, yeah, you know, if those brown-eyed kids get out of line, you might want to use that. I mean, he's drawing a line from they're getting out of place to we need to keep, we need to physically be violent to beat them, to keep them in their place, right? Okay. Um, so back to the kid thing. I'll say this. I think kids are very impressionable, but this I see in like girl groups. When you were in like grade school and stuff, was it, and this is what I'm told by students. I'm just checking in on you if this resonates or not. On any given day, you could be the girl that's out of that group. You'll be in the next day maybe, or the day after that, and you don't know when that's happening, but there's just a time when you are out. I'm seeing almost everybody shake their head on all the screens, right? Okay, so yeah, I mean, let's not pretend that kids aren't navigating this world in a sociological manner, trying to mimic, right, and see how they can do, and anticipatory socialization is what they call that in sociology. And so, yeah, they're looking at adults for behaviors and taking cues from adults. And not all those cues are positive necessarily. Okay, good. What else stands out to you? That learning piece is a, is a big deal. What else? Well, one thing kind of switching from the kids, but to the adult section, one thing I thought was interesting was how quick the adults got like really hostile too. Like there was that one lady in the blue eyed group who really started like arguing back with, uh, with Jane Elliott and then she used her as an example. Um, so I thought that was really interesting where it's like, even when you get, even when you're an adult, like you, you saw the name calling kind of in both. Oh, which I yeah. thought was really interesting because I don't know, as, as somebody who started becoming an adult, I like to think I'm, you know, more mature than I was as a kid, but I know that's probably not true because there's a lot of instances where, yeah, I resort to like, you know, very kid-like behaviors. <laughs> And I just thought it was interesting how, and also how like their hostility after, you know, kind of being put down was then used as an excuse to put them down more. Right. And so we're talking here about, we're identifying in school people of color. You speak up, you do something I don't like. And even if you're trying to defend yourself and you didn't do anything wrong, you're now, we've used this term in the past dominant culture, has you're now uppity. You're now being argumentative, right? And that's that, like, it's, it's one of those scenarios where you simply can't win. And, and this is how she is also illustrating it is very difficult as a person of color to want to speak up and say something. But we could look at Barack Obama. Barack Obama had pretty much to have four flawless years of behavior. Because if Michelle or Barack get angry, so, so suddenly you're that angry person of color. You're that, right? You're fulfilling all these dominant culture stereotypes, which I would say that people in dominant culture, white folks, uh, get, get angry unreasonably all the time as well. But we don't hold them to the same standards, right? And so, yeah, yeah, very interesting. Now, to understand this, she does the same thing with Oprah. You could Google it and find an old Oprah show. She absolutely is pissing people off and they're about to flip out. They turn up the heat in the waiting room. They don't give you the Oprah present, right? They bring you in late, right? She brought these people, they purposely brought these people in late. And the first thing she says is, it'd behoove you next time to get to a meeting on time, right? So she purposely did it. 
Now you got to tell me one piece here because people of color understand this. And this is something that dominant culture, right? Depending on the level of resistance and privilege that you have or do not have that you've been afforded or not afforded. Remember them in the waiting room? What did the adults start to do after like five minutes? And this is huge. This, and this is so huge, I can't even, it's huge. What did the adults start doing? Didn't they start like talking to each other and one of them was like, oh, let's, let's just all walk in together and like. Yeah, they were yeah. grouping together and making little plans, but they talked about doing something that is like mind blowing. We should do what? We should all sing, we shall overcome. That's what they said. Do you remember that? We should all sing or something. And somebody said, like, we shall overcome. And they're like, yeah. Now you have to understand, this is people in dominant culture in a waiting room for 10 extra minutes. And this is how you know if you've had privilege in your lifetime. If after 10 minutes of something that doesn't suit you and you're in dominant culture, you are ready to sing the anthem of the civil rights movement that people died for you might not have ever been uh, discriminated against much in your life. Do you see what I'm saying? That's a really, like they're thinking that this is massive amounts of discrimination. You're in a waiting room for 10 minutes. Like, like it's so interesting to me because you've got this exercise going on and they know it, they're adults, right? There's signs that say, don't let somebody date a, a, a blue eyed or a brown eyed, excuse me. So she flips it on purpose, right? Now with the kids, she flipped it, but with adults, she never flips it. She always makes brown eyed people dominant and blue eyed people disadvantaged. Why? And why doesn't she flip it? I was uh, talking to a friend when I was watching the movie, cause we watched it on like a big projector. And he said that um, he, he thought it was interesting that she would choose the like brown eyes for the adults. Cause they're more likely to have um, brown eyes if you're of color and you're more likely to have blue eyes if you're white. Absolutely. So she takes people and puts them in the non-dominant group more. And that is just a breakup that's going to be more likely, right? People always ask me, what if you have hazel eyes? You're in the brown eye group. Okay. That's, that's like me. That's, that's sort of neither here nor there, but that's what she does. And why doesn't she flip it for adults? There's a very, 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 very important reason. And it's not that brown-eyed people, it says with the majority of people, it's, it's the, the reason she chooses blue-eyed folks on the bottom is because more European descent, more chance that you are likely a dominant culture member, right? Because she wants people that are my, in minority culture to be able to step forward in a different way. But why doesn't she flip this around? Somebody give me the answer. Come on, go. Because she wants them to see one side and like yeah. see how their friends are like. Yeah, but then she, might, then she might flip it. What's, and that's okay, the good answer, but what, what am I looking for? Tell me, who's got it? Why doesn't she flip it? Is it because like in like real society, it's never really flipped? Absolutely, right? She doesn't flip it because it doesn't change. There's nothing that you can do as a person of color to make that go away, right? That is what you are and who you are. And that's how people see you. So she's not about to do that. Okay, what are some more good things with the adults that she said? Anybody? I thought it was funny when she called out the woman. Uh, she was like, for a woman to be doing or saying these things, it's really disappointing. Because I think she wanted her to like, if she was like all the things that she says she was, she would have gotten the point of the. Yeah, she wasn't getting the color piece, was she? No. Maybe she would understand that. She says, I resent that behavior doubly as a woman because you're making me look bad, yeah. right? She said this, she said, "Do what was her response? Somebody said, do you think you're one of the important blue eyed people? Yeah. What'd she say? She said she like learned to be she more blue eyed because she had like a husband with blue eyes and children with blue eyes. 
or brown eyes, I guess. Or brown eyes, so, sorry, yeah. But yeah, that was my bad. But yeah, she's got a husband with brown eyes. She's got kids with brown eyes. And when you learn to act brown enough, you too will have access. That's called assimilation, right? That's what dominant culture wants minority culture to just let kids get all, can't we all get along? Can't we all be like us? That's really what assimilation is saying. But people of color are always like, well, assimilation doesn't make any sense because we need to recognize the diverse things that we bring to the table, right? So that is, you know, one approach um, from dominant culture that's, you know, be like us. Now, did that ever happen? Look, who's heard of Cab Calloway? Raise your hand. Heidi, 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 ho, right? He's in the Blues Brothers. It's, he was a famous jazz cat, man, forever. 20, or 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you name it. Amazing dude, Cap Calloway. But like a lot of people at the time, he would straighten his hair. Now, who knows what lie is in here? Anybody, any gangsters in the room? Trying to dispose of bodies, get rid of fingerprints? <laughs> lie is a chemical that if you soak your fingerprints in it, it will actually eat through your skin and take those off. Gangsters in the 1920s used to do that. It's, it's a chemical and it burns. And they would put that in black like hair so that you could straighten it out, but you had to keep it on there for a while and then it burns your scalp and then you can comb through it. Now, it's a damaging process, it's painful process, and people who were African-Americans at the time, especially like Cab Calloway knew that if you assimilate a little bit, it gives you more access to what we call as sociologists, the goods in society, right? You have access to more of those things because you assimilate and look more like white culture. So although we say, yeah, that assimilation piece, I don't know if that's really her analogy works, it works. People disfigure their bodies to be accepted by dominant culture to the detriment of their health and, and their culture and their ethnicity. So she's really nailing that one too, right? Okay, what else stands out um, in this conversation of hers? Go ahead, um, Go ahead, Quentin. I was, throughout the thing, especially with the kids, I was thinking about William Golding's Lord of the Flies. Not so much the, um, the brutality or like the, the violence associated, but like definitely the tribalism and just how quickly stuff like that can establish. And it was interesting for me after having read that book a few years ago to see um, that in practice, like in reality, not just in, in a fictional story, it actually did come to pass rather quickly um, as it did in the book. So I just found that interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. And this is that also that in-group, out-group behavior, you know, that we look at in sociology. They have valued, we have valued traits that they lack, right? Somebody talked here uh, about the Crown Act to help those who are impacted by wearing their natural hair. And, and that is at least becoming more of a thing on people's radar, right? Um, good. Who else? What else stands out about this to you, the blue-eyed, brown-eyed piece? And I've seen her take a 350-pound man, have him be crushed into tears, crying on the ground. And he's like, he's like, you're not treating me right. I'm sad. And she's like, I don't care. And he's like, my mother died. And she's like, I'm not your mother. Don't, don't you look at me for help. I'm not that person. Get over it. So this is something that has really incredible. If you go out there and look at some of them, some of the reactions are pretty extreme. Of course, we've got the one woman here that's just like the whole time she's misbehaving. They give her the standardized test. We know that many standardized tests have been written in favor of dominant culture. And if you listen to her calling out the scores, they are very low, right? So they flipped this one. This is more stuff that people of color might know coming from African American communities, Latino communities, people who are in dominant culture that take that test, you know, nine, 10, you know, they're reading out numbers that are, that are really low because standardized testing has been biased in dominant culture's favor for quite a long time. All right, what else stands out to you about the Jane Elliott piece? Um, I think another interesting sh thing she did was she attributed like the positive attributes of one person to the entire group if they were the in-group and then she would like encourage the children to associate those attributes to an entire group, like if it's negative for the out group or positive for the in group. 
Yep, absolutely. And at one point, that guy's like, is she, she's like, is she, is she being argumentative? Yes. Is she being rude? Yes. Is she, right? And he answers all those things. And she's like, are these all the things that we've come to expect from a person with that color eyes? All right. Um, yeah, good. Uh, she stands up in one of these things that she does where she's in a room with like 3,000 people. And she says, the first thing she says is, stand up if you would be willing to trade places with a person of color. And in 3,000 people, not one person stands up in the auditorium. And she said, this tells me a couple things. One, we know that you know that you don't want to be treated that way, so it's real. Two, right, you are okay with the privilege you have, right? And if you aren't being picked on or I'm not levying this at you, <clears throat> then you're going to be quiet, right? So it's a big metaphor. We know and this doesn't mean that you don't, right? This is, again, that guilt responsibility thing. Everybody on this page, no matter what shade your skin is or where you come from or whatever that is, has challenges in your life. Some of them are not massive systemic inequality pieces built into a system. We're not saying they don't have challenges. But what we are saying is that, generally speaking, people do not want to trade places with a person of color. And that means that they not only know that that is real, but they know that they don't want it for themselves. Okay? So that is one of those pieces where suddenly we start to talk about how do we dismantle systemic privilege, right? And how do we really start to get these pieces to equal out more? And again, just because we raise some people up this way, doesn't mean that people in dominant culture are losing a ton. It simply means that we're trying to fulfill everything that we have said is our goal in this country, but a lot of it we have left unfulfilled, right? We have not taken those steps, whether that's pay based on gender, whether that's disability and levels of ability, whether that's race, right, with what we're talking about. All right, a couple more things. Anything else stand out to you folks um, about the Jane Elliott piece or have any sort of overall kind of comments? Uh, something that, oh, uh, something that really like stood out to me was in like the, the part where she was like the second video where she was like lecturing in front of a college. Um, she had said like abortion isn't about like women's rights or faith. It, she was like, it's about keeping the white men or the white majority. Like if you don't allow white women to get abortions, then there'll be more white people because she's like the people in charge who are white want to like keep the white majority because if not they're scared that like minorities will treat them how they've treated minorities in the past yeah I and i mean really interesting we hear that all the time and and, and there's a couple things a couple trigger words for people of dominant culture one is reparations and the other is affirmative action and we know that even though we've identified affirmative action it accounts for almost nothing in as far as how it impacts people's lives College scholarships based on race alone, 0.025% of all college scholarships. I'm not a math guy, but that's one quarter of 1%, right? Oh, oh hold on. Oh, all right. Um, so we'll continue this next time, uh, everybody. I've got somebody that I knew was showing up today um, that, I, that I'm talking to about, uh, about my mom's estate. So this is sort of, I have to do this. Um, but I will be back, uh, and we're going to do, let's, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit and continue this a little bit on Friday at 11. I'll record it, but I don't, cause I don't want to bail out here, but I absolutely have to do this, but I'm going to, if you don't, if you're not here, I'll record it. And if you are, um, then we're going to continue this session cause I think it's important. All right. Thanks everybody. Hey, be good people and do good things. I will see you next time and I'll upload this. Peace. Thank you. Yep.